The following program is made possible in part by a grant from the Sara Lee Corporation. Since 1965, the Lincoln Academy of Illinois has brought together a distinguished body of business, labor, educational, cultural, and community leaders. Their purpose, to recognize those singular individuals whose lives have brought honor to Illinois in the spirit of its most famous son, Abraham Lincoln. They are people who have done an outstanding thing in their own discipline, uh, whether it's communications or fine arts or, or religion, they've done an outstanding thing. On the other hand, they've been able to carry that out to other people to help humanity. And that's uh, part of our mission statement, people who have done things to help others in, in a big way for humanity. Laureates are inducted into the Lincoln Academy in a formal convocation ceremony they are presented by the governor with the Order of Lincoln, the state's highest honor for individual achievement. Its colors of red, violet, and green symbolize the state bird, the cardinal, the state flower, the violet, and the leaves of the state tree, the oak. Patterned upon the learned academies of Europe, this nonpartisan, not-for-profit organization is unique among the 50 states. From our investigation, uh, there's nothing quite as unique as this and put, in, uh, put on with the same kind of uh, attention and formality. And I think in a case like this, formality means a lot. It, uh, it is the state's highest award. The Lincoln Academy's activities also include recognition of outstanding senior students at each of Illinois' four-year colleges and universities, and the Hall of Fame of Historic Illinoisans, honoring those of achievement who lived prior to the founding of the Academy. Honored as laureates this year in ceremonies at the Illinois State Capitol, a beloved poet and voice of conscience, an innovator in business and philanthropy, a jazz legend and educator, a statesman respected by all parties, a sports owner and community leader, a lawyer fighting injustice and inequality, and a spiritual leader of faith and courage. Now for the key part of the convocation, the traditional ceremony, when we recognize the work of famous Illinois citizens, citizens by birth or residence. The new laureates have been selected by the office, officers, regents, and general trustees of the academy in a procedure that commenced early last year. They are to be honored by the state of Illinois and decorated with the Order of Lincoln by the governor who also serves as president of the academy. I now ask that Lois Staines, a general trustee of the academy, read the citation for laureate Gwendolyn Brooks. Born in Topeka, Kansas, Pulitzer Prize winner and Poet Laureate of Illinois, Gwendolyn Brooks, has been aptly called a living national treasure. Since the publication of her first book of poems in 1945, she has written of what she knows, the struggle for identity, dignity, and truth, and in doing so has touched the hearts and minds of readers spanning generations. A resident of Chicago since infancy, Ms. Brooks in her poetry and prose has given a voice to the young, the struggling, and the oppressed. Her second published book of poems, Annie Allen, won the Pulitzer Prize in 1950, making her the first African American, though she herself prefers black with a capital B, a recipient of that award. She followed that success with more than 20 volumes of poetry. Her work has won high praise for its human dimension, particularly its portrayals of blacks seeking identity, acceptance, and solidarity. Governor Edgar, it is my privilege to present to you as a laureate of the Lincoln Academy, Ms. Gwendolyn Brooks.
She stands tall and stands her ground. No one can move her or push her away. One of the country's most celebrated women of letters, Gwendolyn Brooks delights in nurturing the talents of young people through a variety of writers' workshops and scholarships. She has sponsored and funded a Young Poets Award program each year since becoming the state's Poet Laureate in 1968. Poetry is still in the world, and children are colliding with some of it. They reach, touch lovely words and strong words with excitement and timid respect. They work hard to merit ownership. Brooks began writing at age seven. She says the award is a way of repaying a debt to those who encouraged her. So I wish there had been such a contest as I have when I was uh, a young girl. Uh, there was nothing of the sort. I was encouraged, though, by one of the editors of um, uh, the Chicago Defender. His name was Dan Burley. And he edited a, po a column called lights and shadows. And I started sending poems to that, and he was very excited. He thought that I was quite talented, encouraged me to keep sending more, and ultimately I had 75 poems published in that column. Brooks calls writing a delicious agony and tells her young admirers that poetry can be a friend to whom you can say too much. You can... Uh, say just so much to any uh, uh, human friend. <laughs> but uh, everything can come out on that paper. You can put down anything that occurs to you. Uh, well, at least I feel that way. I do meet a good many poets who say they cannot write down everything that they're thinking. Somebody might see it. <laughs> But they don't want to see it. But I feel if you're that timid, you're not really uh, a writer. A self-described people poet, Brooks has drawn much of her inspiration from the people of Chicago's South Side, where she has faithfully chronicled the rich and complex tapestry of the city's black community. There might be a person I know happens to be black. Blackness has some degree of uh, specialness for every black person. So every black person can tell you a different story. A veteran social and community activist, Brooks does not mince words in speaking her mind on issues affecting her people. Familyhood, the current motion to make the phrase African-American an official identification is cold and excluding. What of our family members in Ghana, in Tanzania, in Kenya, in Nigeria, in South Africa, in Brazil? Why are we pushing them out of our consideration, out of our concern? The capitalized names black and blacks were appointed to comprise an open, sensitizing, wide-stretching, unifying, empowering umbrella. And I, that's the way I see it. I feel that uh, blacks should consider themselves family. At age 80, Brooks always keeps a pen and tablet at hand, ready to distill life into poetry. Oh, yes, I'll keep writing. That doesn't mean that I finish a poem every day. But there's no day that I don't put notes to paper, some impression of what has, what has happened to me or to others that day, what I've seen and felt. I salute every Illinoisan with this, my familiar instruction. Go ahead and live your life. You might be surprised the world might continue. The world might continue. Go on with your preparations, moving among the quick and the dead, nourishing here, there, pressing a hand among the ruins and among the
the seeds of restoration. Hold on. Remember Mahalia Jackson used to sing, hold on. Born in Chicago, Leonard H. Lavin is the innovative founder of the multinational Alberta Culver Company and a generous philanthropist whose support for numerous charitable organizations has given hope to the needy and opportunity to the disadvantaged and disabled. A trade journal attributed Mr. Lavin's success to his willingness to take risks, his ability to discover new approaches, and just plain hard work. Mr. Lavin is one of the finest examples of a corporate leader who places philanthropy at the top of his list of priorities. Governor Edgar, it is my privilege to present to you as a laureate of the Lincoln Academy, Mr. Leonard H. Lavin. Honesty, eth ethical behavior, uh, credibility, uh, enthusiasm, believability in what you're selling, all that together, I believe, is what makes a good salesperson. Alberto Culver founder Leonard Lavin learned sales the hard way, crisscrossing the country, selling home permanent products following naval service in World War II. I made every city of 15,000 or larger in the whole United States. It took me about a year and a half, and uh, I gained a tremendous amount of experience that time. And I was so naive that when I came home, I hadn't taken any money from them. And here I had $65,000 waiting for me, huge sum of money. Lavin built upon that experience, launching his own sales companies and purchasing others. In 1955, he purchased a small professional beauty care company with a brand of hairdressing called Alberto V05. I thought to myself the product had a lot of merit and uh, this was something you could run with and build. And so I made arrangements to buy it and we did that. I brought it back to Chicago, the company. And then that's when Bernice got in the picture. I asked her please to uh, give up her job and come to work for me. She, uh, she had a big job in those days. She was a controller for a major automotive company, automotive supply company. And uh, I guess my charm persuaded her. It wasn't the money because she took a, a big hit. She was making 50000 a year in those days and uh, she came to work for Alberto Culver for 5000 a year. But she's made it up. Lavin pioneered television advertising to make Alberto V05 a household name. Today, Alberto Culver generates over $1.6 billion in sales worldwide thanks to marketing savvy, product innovation, and dedicated people. Alberto Culver was an early believer in hiring women in key executive positions. We have to be an entrepreneurial company. I like to think we are, and we have to because we don't have the resources that the majors have, the huge companies. We have to move faster. We have to take advantage of opportunities. And I think women are more attuned to that area than men are, or at least the women we have. Over the years, a philosophy of corporate giving became integral to the company's values. I've always been a curious type of person, and my wife has too. And, uh, you get interested in other problems, somebody else's problems, and out of that comes, uh, if not problems, opportunities, and comes the idea of behind, if I can be of help, I'd like to help. Corporate and personal giving initiatives have been important sources of support in children's issues, health care and rehabilitation, and issues facing women in the workplace. Personal experience, like Bernice Lavin's painful battle with childhood arthritis, has guided much of the company's charitable work. As a consequence, she, she's led the company into uh, major contributions to, for example, the Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago. And as far as children go, 
my daughter lost a uh, full-size baby in her ninth month, and she became uh, very concerned about that. Lo and behold, the people at Northwestern Hospital, they had a unit called Prentice, and uh, that led to a number of contributions that the company made for that particular unit. The Alberto Culver Women's Health Center, which we dedicated in 1992, would not have been possible without the generous support from the family and the assistance of the Friends of Prentice. The Bernice e. Lavin Children's Care Center at Northwestern is the latest example of their commitment. I don't think we've ever experienced the uh, type of satisfaction that we've experienced from this particular venture. It's not a venture from this particular project we went into. Uh, people come up to me at different affairs, not necessarily connected with the hospital, but different affairs telling me that they work in Northwestern and what a great joy this is and how wonderful it is. Now they feel that they can do their work well, knowing that their children are well taken care of. And it's, it's been a happy experience. When I started Alberto Culver, looking at a first year with sales of $100,000, and debts of $430,000, I didn't know whether I'd be around long enough to make the se second year, let alone to be here today. But I continue to follow my father's advice. He always told me, you must speculate to accumulate, but always keep one foot on first base. In other words, don't get tagged out of the game. I remember when we gave our first major gift, which was to the Rehabilitation Institute, and more than we could afford, actually or the nights that Bernice spent helping important groups like United Cerebral Palsy get established in Chicago. We were not doing that in the hope of being honored, but because we believed that in many ways the community was an extension of the company, and we approached its problems in the same way we did business problems. I thank God for an inquiring mind, the energy and desire, and the talents that have made contributions both to our company and our community and I thank you for the recognition of those contributions today. Thank you. Born in Chicago, jazz legend and music educator Ramsey Lewis has enjoyed a remarkable and varied career, giving pleasure to countless millions who have watched him perform and have listened to his recordings. From his youth in Chicago, he imagined a career in music, first as a classical pianist before turning to jazz while in college. His Ramsey Lewis Trio, which recorded its first album in 1956, played before sold out crowds in jazz halls for years. Mr. Lewis's popularity has continued unabated, whether he plays solo or with other musicians. Chicago area young people are the focus of Mr. Lewis's civic commitment. He is a director of the Merritt Music Program, an inner city high school music program. He has established the Ravinia Festival's mentoring program for high school students and is active with Cycle, a self-help program for inner city youth. Governor Edgar, it is my privilege to present to you as a laureate of the Lincoln Academy Mr. Ramsey E. Lewis. People have always asked me, you know, where did you get your style? How did you get your style? But people like Billy Taylor, Dizzy Gillespie, Maurice White, a couple others got my attention by saying, you know, the time that you spent playing in church, which is considerable, and the time you, I still studied the classics, but I started taking piano lessons at four years old and it was all classical. In fact, by the time I was 11, 12, 13, it was going to be Bach, Mozart, and Beethoven around the world, concertized. So there's gospel music, there's classical music. There's pop music, I mean, Rosemary Clooney as well as Billie Holiday and Perry Como as well as Nat Cole and, and Lester Young, all this stuff. Um, Dad brought home some jazz records and he was really into Art Tatum and other pianists, Dorothy Donegan and, and, 
Earl, Father Hines, Count Basie, Duke Ellington. I didn't pay a lot of attention to it, but it was there. If I liked it, I absorbed it. And so here years later, I see that gospel, um, classical, European classical, um, and pop music um, comes out in my style, in my own way. Beginning with the Ramsey Lewis Trio of the 1950s, Lewis has showcased that unique piano style through some 60 albums, winning three Grammy Awards and earning seven gold records. He loves jazz as a personal expression. In jazz, you pick up your instrument or you sit down to your instrument in my case, and you let these notes come. And these notes, which are new, no notes are actually new, but the combination of the way you place them is, is your style. And that personal expression to me uh, is very important. If you're playing in a trio, quintet, whatever, duo, you have to maintain what you personally feel, but at the same time, you're reacting to what else is going on around you. And when the other person or the other persons are performing, it's up to you to support them, encourage what they're doing, but at the same time, stay out of the way. Now, it sounds like two extremes, uh, but not really. It's um, very democratic. I mean, you get to put your two cents in. You know, and uh, you're, you're, At the same time, you're, you're part of the whole, but you're an individual. When I was coming up, there were places we could go to meet the masters and say hello to Oscar Peterson, say hello to Errol Garner. You got to say, how did you do this? How did you play that? In fact, Oscar Peterson was very kind. I met him and was asking him these questions. He said, well, why don't you stop by the hotel tomorrow afternoon and I'll show you these things. Lewis wants to make sure today's kids get the same opportunity He's doing that as artistic director of the Ravinia Festival. We now have uh, the Ravinia Mentor Program where we have six professional, uh, internationally known jazz musicians who go out to 10 high schools. I think there's, uh, each mentor visits at least, the same school at least four or five different times to work with the band director, uh, but to share their experience, to share their technique, and um, their life on the road or with that, this or that musician. In the jazz tradition, what he does uh, is to share his experience and his knowledge with a ver wide variety of people, whether it's on the radio, whether it's on television, uh, whether it's uh, uh, with young folks, uh, you know, he does all that. It's inspiring to me to know that there's something that I can give back to the community. There's something, and you know, Giving back material things is important, but I think giving of yourself is just as important, and one without the other is meaningless. Jazz embraces and celebrates individuality. Louis Armstrong shared with us his inner song. Duke Ellington, Art Tatum, Charlie Parker, and 10,000 others, truly, as democratic an art form as the world has ever seen. These days, we often hear the term kids at risk. Let us think instead in terms of kids at promise. And let us help them realize that promise and take the music of this century into the next. I thank the members of the Academy for this honor. I thank all those who came before me who helped me get to the table. And I thank all those young musicians of the Chicago Public High Schools whose inner songs we will soon be hearing. Thank you. Born in Peoria, Robert H. Michael represent the 18th District of Illinois in the United States House of Representatives for 38 years, earning the respect of his constituents and colleagues on both sides of the congressional aisle for his hard work, integrity, and fairness. Elected to his first term in 1956, Congressman Michael was re-elected 18 more times. 
becoming Republican whip in 1974 and House Minority Leader in 1980. Republicans and Democrats alike learned to admire Congressman Michael for his attention to legislative detail and willingness to find common ground on important legislative issues. Throughout his distinguished career, Mr. Michael has chosen to lead by choosing compromise over combat, substance over style, and good government above all. Governor Edgar, it is my privilege to present to you as a laureate of the Lincoln Academy, Mr. Robert H. Michael. This is Bob Michael, your Republican candidate for Congress. Freedom, if it is to be ours, must be based on a foundation of truth. When I was first sent to Congress, you know, it wasn't with a big chart, a laundry list of things to do. Bob, go to Washington, cut the cost of government, get it off our back, and reduce my taxes. That was my mission, that, or that was my charge. Bob Michael was elected to Congress in 1955, but he already had years of experience on Capitol Hill. His predecessor, Harold Veldy, had hired him for his staff fresh out of Bradley University following World War II. Illinois' legendary senator, Everett Dirksen, was his mentor in the early years. You learn what it was really like to have this camaraderie and, and among members of, uh, of the opposite part, you know, your own party, sure, but also of the other party so that when it really came to work time, you were able to work together in a very um, uh, cooperative uh, way, although uh, never diminishing the intensity of the debate on the floor, in that case of the Senate, in our case on the House. It's got to be there. There's nothing wrong with that. But what I have to kind of admonish my colleagues, or at least in my latter years serving, was but don't cross the line of impugning one's motives uh, simply because they're opposed to your point of view. Keep, it argue, keep the argument on the substance of the issue, not on the personality. Mr. Speaker, I understand the Democratic caucus has briefed, was briefed this morning on what was described as a political document. That will... Michael proved a tough debater and a popular spokesman for his party as he rose to leadership. Like he loved the work, the, the people, the and of being of service. You know, people say, when all else fails, go see your congressman. And it's like the alderman, you know, he can't get, well, get your garbage and uh, taken care of and other things. Uh, it is, it's kind of a, a court of last resort. I've tried everything. But I'll tell you, it, it was, um, it's that being able to be of service to people. And yes, being at the focal point of where the action really is, hey, you're really uh, determining what uh, what other people are going to have to the laws under which they're going to have to live when i became leader then it was all a much more profound because then i was i was invited to the up to the white house meetings on a weekly basis i was with my colleagues in both house and senate in the leadership where foreign policy was actually developed where my views were actually be, being asked where uh, you really you know it was really uh, at at the focal point of the action, and I, that I really, and that's very satisfying. Michael served under presidents from Dwight Eisenhower to Bill Clinton, who awarded him the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 1994. He counted many presidents as friends. He has especially fond memories of fellow Illinoisan Ronald Reagan and of his leadership in ending the Cold War. He had the, the, the vision and the, and the communication skill to marshal the forces to get us to the point where we could face the Russians down. And it was done in a peaceful sort of way when to the degree uh, that the whole thing, the from the standpoint of the old Soviet Union, it just, uh, it just got, became obliterated, you know. <laughs> and it was a wonderful thing that he did. But it was peace through strength, peace through strength. Of his own service, Michael treasures the memory that even though he served in the minority for 38 years, he went to work every day knowing that he could make a difference. I had 192 solid Republicans, you know, to keep them together, that's one thing. 
then to reach over the other side of the aisle to get 27, 28, whatever it required at that day for that magic number to win. That, that is satisfying for a legislator who wants to win. And, you know, and, and then the other thing is standing down there in the well of the House on, on a given issue and being able to take on 434 of your contemporaries uh, uh, who are out there to puncture your case, maybe. And you can stand your ground, and you're well enough posted and informed that, again, in the end, you win the amendment. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's satisfying. And now that I'm semi-retired and no longer in the active arena, I can look back and say that I did make the right decision in opting for public service. Uh, I enjoyed campaigning, uh, debating public policy, uh, representing my central Illinois constituents, and eventually shouldering the responsibility of my leadership roles. It was a good run, stimulating and satisfying. Thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. All of the Michael family uh, are deeply appreciative of what the Lincoln Academy has done this evening to recognize our contribution uh, to public service. Inherited by the land of Lincoln from his birthplace in Brooklyn, New York, Jerry M. Reinsdorf has had a profound effect on professional sports in America. As an owner of the Chicago White Sox and the Chicago Bulls, two highly successful teams that have contributed to Chicago's stature as the preeminent sports city in America. In the vanguard of the development of two new state-of-the-art sports facilities, Comiskey Park and the United Center, Mr. Reinsdorf has contributed immeasurably to Chicago's standing as a leader in professional athletics. He was a catalyst for the important work of Chicago White Sox Charities, which raises funds for cancer research and programs for children and senior citizens. He has also been recognized for his work with the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, Operation Push, March of Dimes, and the Interfaith Organizing Project. Governor Edgar, it is my privilege to present to you as a laureate of the Lincoln Academy, Mr. Jerry M. Reinsdorf. great victory for our club and for our fans. Tonight, as great as our players were, the energy and the life in this building I know made the difference of putting them over the top. So thank you, all the fans of the Chicago Bulls. Jerry Reinsdorf never dreamed of being a sports owner as a kid in Brooklyn. The young Dodgers fan just dreamed of having enough money to own a car when he grew up. Pee Wee Reese was, uh, was my hero or my idol, my favorite player anyway. You know, I've always admired leaders, and, and uh, Pee Wee was the captain of the Dodgers, and he was the guy that put his arm around Jackie Robinson, and uh, so he, I always admired him, and I guess my second favorite player was Duke Snyder, because uh, Duke lived on our block for several years uh, d during the summer, and he used to come out and play stickball with the kids, so he probably was my second favorite, and I was a big admirer of uh, Red Barber, the, the, uh, the radio announcer, because uh, you know, he really taught all of us in Brooklyn what, what baseball was all about. Reinsdorf came to Chicago in 1957 to attend law school at Northwestern, graduating to become a tax lawyer with the IRS. Private law practice launched a real estate career, providing him with the capital to buy the Chicago White Sox in 1981 and the business experience to develop new venues for the Sox and later the Chicago Bulls. Even if somebody could have waved the magic wand and restored Comiskey Park to, to, to mint condition the way it was when it was built in 1910, that wouldn't have been good enough anymore because under the, the economics that exist in sports, you have to have uh, uh, you have to have suites, you have to have luxury seats, you have to have clubs, so that you can generate the revenues to pay the salaries in order to remain competitive. And the same thing with the United Center. There we had a stadium that was rock solid. The old Chicago Stadium probably could have stood another 50 years. But it was economically obsolete because we couldn't generate the revenues that would be necessary to pay the players so that we could compete. And, and that was the reason why that one had to be replaced. Chicago had been a city where its sports franchises had not done very well. 
And I'd always felt like all fans that, boy, if I could run a team, I would do a better job. And so, you know, it gave me a chance to do a better job than had been done with the White Sox and with the Bulls and, and to give back to the community. And, it, you know, it's one of the great pleasures. I view my responsibility to the fans as, as having franchises that compete consistently. I mean, it's too much to expect to win a, a title every year. It's probably too much to expect to win five in seven years. Uh, but but what, what I hope to have for our fans is our teams that each and every year have a realistic chance of winning and, 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 and present good entertainment when they, when they go to see them play. Reinsdorf believes sports teams have a responsibility to the communities that support them, like school reading programs sponsored by the Chicago White Sox and a community learning and activity center named in honor of Michael Jordan's late father. Each of the teams has somebody who's in charge of civic and charitable activities, and uh, essentially the, uh, the marching orders to the, to the person at the Bulls is uh, to try to do things to help the community that the Bulls uh, uh, live in or work in. And so we, f we focused a great deal on the west side of Chicago. And of course, the building of the James Jordan Boys and Girls uh, Club and Family Life Center is, is, is something that we're very proud of. And the focus of the Chicago White Sox is the public school system. Um, and because I've long felt that education is the way out of the ghetto. Uh, it's not welfare, it's not handouts, it's education. And if, if, if the kids don't learn to read, by the, by, you know, they can be lost by the second or third grade. And so th that focus is very important to us. And while the Bulls owner would always like to see another championship, the baseball fan in him still has hopes. You know, I enjoy what I'm doing. I still have one big goal left, and, and that's for the White Sox to win a World Series uh, and to win it before the Cubs do. Uh, so uh, that, 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 that's sort of the focus, and then, you know, that may or may not happen. I mean, I think, I think uh, the Cubs and the White Sox have played 169 seasons without either team winning a World Series. That makes me feel pretty good. <laughs> now, some people succeed because they're smart. In my case, it was a combination of hard work, incredible luck, and the help of many people, more people than I could list if I stood here for an hour. Now, two very important people are here tonight, people who probably had as profound an impact on my life as anybody. One is Jim Thompson. Without his incredible leadership, there would be no Comiskey Park and probably no Chicago White Sox. The person who contributed the most to my success is also here, my wife, Martille. I have seen many, many talented people fail to achieve to the level of their capability because a spouse held them back. In my case, I never could have succeeded without her. Compared to the other honorees, both this year and past years, my accomplishments have been small and I have a hard time understanding why I'm receiving this award. But as one of my players once said after winning a game that we didn't deserve to win, we take it. <laughs> well, thank you. Born in Chicago, Seymour Simon graduated first in his class at Northwestern University School of Law in 1938. And he has been at the forefront of the legal profession ever since. Justice Simon was elected in 1974 to the Illinois Appellate Court. And six years later, he handily defeated five other candidates for a seat on the Illinois Supreme Court. As one of seven justices, he distinguished himself as an independent voice, unafraid to disagree with the majority. Justice Simon once remarked of the court, if we were one unanimous, happy little group, we wouldn't be a good court. It must have been a good court when he served because Justice Simon wrote nearly as many dissenting opinions as majority opinions during his eight-year tenure. At a time when the court ruled on such important issues as the death penalty, legislative cutbacks, and handgun bans. Governor Edgar, it is my privilege to present to you as a laureate of the Lincoln Academy of Illinois, Justice Seymour Simon. Seymour Simon has always been optimistic about the American people. 
He learned about it firsthand as a teenage tour guide at Chicago's Century of Progress in 1933, the height of the Great Depression. It showed me that the people of our nation have uh, courage, strength, vitality, and optimism. And it were those qualities that carried us through the Depression. It was those qualities that permitted us to revive after that terrible day of infamy at Pearl Harbor. And after the war, it's those same qualities that uh, helped us attack many of the evils that there are in this country, such as racism, such as inequality, such as uh, lack of proper education. And uh, I think we've made great strides. Uh, not enough, but we're moving. And uh, that's why I'm an optimist. I'm an optimist from the time I saw people come to Chicago in the midst of the Depression to see the century of progress. Those were optimistic people. Simon began his legal career as an antitrust lawyer, defending the rights of small business owners like independent theaters, denied access to the latest films by the big studios and their movie houses. I was able to get him money uh, for having been suppressed for a long while, and I was able to get them the opportunity to compete, to bid for the early run of pictures. Simon went into politics in the mid-1950s, elected as an alderman from Chicago's 40th Ward. He served from 1955 to 1961, and again from 1967 to 1974. In between, he served on the Cook County Board of Commissioners and was its chairman from 1962 to 1966. He was a self-described skinflint on the city council and county board, but he also fought film censorship and racial discrimination. Simon was elected to the Illinois Appellate Court in 1974 and won election to the Illinois Supreme Court in 1980, where he was a staunch opponent of the death penalty. My feelings are that it doesn't work. It's, it's chancy. The chance of anyone being given a death penalty is just as chancy as Justice Potter Stewart, when he was U.S. Supreme Court judge, said, just as chancy as uh, being struck by lightning. Simon cites the case of former death row inmate Rolando Cruz. The last time that Cruz was up before this court, the court had already uh, affirmed the conviction and the death sentence by a four to three vote. And then there was a petition for rehearing. And uh, had an election not intervened, I'm sure the petition would have been denied four to three, and Cruz would not have had that last trial that proved that uh, the sheriffs uh, had not been uh, truthful and that he was innocent. But there was an election, two new judges came on the court, and the four to three for conviction turned out four to three for a new trial. I'd say that was a chance. Simon believes his obligation as a reviewing court judge was to the Constitution, not the veneer that other judges had placed upon it. Best example of uh, why erroneous interpretations of the Constitution have to be changed is, uh, is segregated education. Uh, Plessy versus Ferguson decided in the 19th century, which said uh, segregated schools were okay as long as they were equal, and they never were equal, uh, was a wrong decision. And uh, uh, much to the credit of the law and the Supreme Court of the United States and Brown versus Board of Education came too late. It should have come many years earlier. Uh, that doctrine was changed. Simon continues his legal practice in an active retirement. He believes the courts must continue the fight against inequality and injustice. It's uh, thrilling to see discrimination, inequality eliminated, and it's important because uh, this country cannot be, cannot continue to be strong uh, if uh, a large part of its citizenry is not well educated, does not have equal opportunity for jobs, for housing, for health, 
for hospitals, for physicians, for life. Mine was frequently a dissenting voice when I believed the needs of society were not served by rulings of other judges. Many times I could have been bound by the hand of the past, but my, experi my experience and the heritage of this land of Lincoln counseled me to speak my own mind even when I stood alone. In so doing, I trust that I pursued justice and that I was just. Today's award is an honor which I humbly cherish now and will for the rest of my days. Born in Columbia, South Carolina, Joseph Cardinal Bernadine was administrative head and spiritual heart of the Roman Catholic Church in Chicago from 1982 until his death in 1996. Chicagoans learned to know, to love and trust Cardinal Bernadine as an energetic leader and a faithful pastor. In the last months of his life, he displayed an exemplary honesty, grace, and quiet confidence as he faced death. He died on November the 14th, 1996, and people of all faith mourn his passing. We recognize Joseph Cardinal Bernardine posthumously for his leadership, humanity, and love for all people. The Cardinal was aware that he was to receive this, and though he's not with us physically, I'm sure he's here in spirit. Governor Edgar, it is my privilege to present Father Michael D. Place, Research Theologian for the Curia and Council for Pub Policy Development, who will receive this award for the Cardinal. Thank you. In faith, we know that through baptism and the gift of the Holy Spirit, we are born to new life. We believe that even in our darkest moments, there's always the promise of redemption. The late Joseph Cardinal Bernadine was a man of faith, intelligence, and ability. He was the youngest Roman Catholic bishop in the country in 1966. Before coming to Chicago, he was Archbishop of Cincinnati. Elected to the College of Cardinals in 1983, Cardinal Bernadine is remembered as a figure of reconciliation and mediation in the church and community. He was a very bright man. Uh, saw the big picture always, uh, but was very sensitive to detail at the same time. Uh, his style was inclusive. He sought uh, advice uh, and the opinions from many people. Uh, in many ways, his leadership was, was intuitive. Certainly, he was a consensus builder, and it was his practice to bring people together around the table and ask that they be as honest as possible and put their positions on the table and then he knew that often he was the one that would have to decide but he felt that in fairness he should hear all the perspectives. There's the special issue too of his willingness to consider women in decision-making positions in the church. Outstanding um, that he would, in, for instance, have a woman as chief of staff, have a woman directing the Office for Divine Worship. Those qualities and a deep personal faith would serve him well as spiritual and administrative leader of the Archdiocese's more than two and one half million Roman Catholics. He began each day, whenever it began, which is, could have been four thirty, five o'clock, giving one hour to the Lord. Uh, and as he said, if he fell asleep, he was falling asleep with the Lord. But that grounded him, and I, I think in many ways the adversities which came later in his life, he would never have been able, he says this in his book, the Gift of Peace, uh, he never would have been able to sustain the manner in which he did if he had not established that personal, in-depth relationship with the Lord. Cardinal Bernadine led the church in important national and international issues, winning the Albert Einstein Peace Award for his work on nuclear arms while writing prolifically on topics like Christian living. Awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 1996, Chicagoans remember him for reaching out to other faiths to tackle problems like racism and poverty 
with a group called Metropolitan Sponsors. He really took dialogue in this community to a new level. Not that there wasn't disagreement, but the disagreement uh, changed character uh, because of the kind of person that he was. The Cardinal said he tried to practice what he preached. Forgiveness in the case of a young man who falsely accused him of sexual impropriety and hope when he was diagnosed with cancer in June 1995. First of all, you have to put yourself totally in the hands of the Lord. Secondly, you have to begin seeing death not so much as an enemy, but as a friend. And thirdly, you have to begin letting go. And if you can do those three things, then you experience peace. He said, you know, there's another way of looking at this, and that is that this is my final teaching opportunity to witness how a believer dies. And my prayer, and I ask you, Mike, pray for me that I'll be able to do that well. Uh, and he did it well. As we know, the Cardinal's faith was a dynamic reality that compelled him to witness to and to work for the unity of the human family. It was his commitment to the common good of the human family that drew him into dialogue with all persons of goodwill and that motivated his leadership on matters of public policy. If the Cardinal were here tonight, I suspect he would have said little about himself but would have used the occasion to raise up the themes I have noted. His goodness and his profound regard for each of us would have left us feeling better about ourselves and hopefully more convinced that indeed it is possible for the world to be, as he said, a kinder, gentler, and more compassionate place. In accepting this honor on his behalf, it is my prayer, as I know it was and believe still is his, that together we can work to realize that conviction. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the governor of Illinois, Jim Edgar. Thank you, Chancellor Trutter. Tonight, I am delighted to gather with you, regents, trustees, and members of the Lincoln Academy, as we once again honor sons and daughters of Illinois who have distinguished themselves and their state in their careers and their lives. They are men and women who, like Lincoln, had the courage, the commitment, and the determination to succeed. Men and women like Gwendolyn Brooks, and Ramsey Lewis, Jr., who have nourished our minds and lifted our spirits with their verse and music. Men like Justice Simon, who guarded our precious individual rights and freedoms. Corporate giants like Leonard Lavin, who has helped the less fortunate among us because he's volunteered his time and talents to countless charities beyond his great success in the private sector. Men like Jerry Reinsdorf, whose hard work and determination brought victory back to Chicago. Men like Bob Michael, whose stellar career in the Congress of the United States was punctuated with, above all else, integrity, fairness, and respect on both sides of the political aisle. And a man like Cardinal Bernadine, who guided and comforted our souls, and through his own life gave us spiritual strength to face our own ordeals. We celebrate their achievements tonight in the name of Illinois' favorite son, and we honor Abraham Lincoln tonight through their hard work, their dedication, their values, and their perseverance. Thank you. Thank you.